What are your thoughts on, uh, I don't even know if I want to call them competitors, but just like other players in the SaaS space, like a Snowflake, uh, Databricks, which is private, not public right now. I mean, to me, my quick thoughts are that they're very richly valued. Um, obviously, Carp has has mentioned these guys by name, and even Carp doesn't think of them as competitors. Carp just thinks of them as like people that he has to compete with in some of these sales calls. And it's kind of absurd he has to compete with them because he's like, they're just selling you in his words, a steak dinner and a PowerPoint versus something that's actually going to transform your organization over the next two decades. Any thoughts on those companies? And are you kind of in the mindset that if there's going to be multiple winners in this space, then yeah, you want to own a little bit of Snowflake and have some exposure to it as well? Well, you can't just pull all the companies uh, like uh, and put them in the same basket because Snowflake is not a uh, PowerPoint. It has a specific use case. Uh, but on the other hand, if if you look at this, uh, what is called scale AI, that's yeah. a stake dinner and the and and the PowerPoint. They're they're not even in the conversation. They just a C three AI is what I would consider a PowerPoint. Like they they upsell what they actually do and say they do things they don't in a very uh, shady scummy way. I actually um, I wouldn't say history, but. Tom Siebel, which is the CEO, sold a CRM system uh, to Oracle called Siebel, yep. <laughs> funnily enough. Yep. And uh, that system is a pile of garbage. <laughs> and he sold it as something as it really wasn't. And Oracle, I mean, really got scammed. And you really have to look out for this. Uh, I, w I would say in terms of competitors, there's not really one. Uh, I know that uh, you've been uh, discussing PayPal recently. I think it's a si similar situation. People look to PayPal like, well, they have all this competition. You have Cash App, you have Apple Pay, like uh, Go Google Pay. Well, like, yes, in segments, they do have competitors. Like, uh, just, just looking at Palantir, aggregating data, sure, there are competitors, but there's no one that does it all. So there's no true competitor while there might be competition within the segments. I mean, you can't really escape that, uh, especially as you see these headlines mentioning that this industry will grow 30% compounded for the next 10 years. Yeah. That breeds competition by default. Like uh, you will see Shamat come out with new SPACs. Uh, well, I, I don't know, but I mean, you get the picture, right? That where there is growth, there will be innovation and there will be key players. But I mean, just look at uh, everyone was really scared when uh, Microsoft uh, came out with their, uh, what what's it called? Fabric? They, they really called it, no, no, they, they call it something really stupid with the, the uh, why, why does the name escape this is a, Was this a while ago or was this recently? It, no, it was. Quite recently, they uh, put out a platform. The uh, CEO was presenting it. Uh, it was called like supply chain uh, system oh, yeah. or something like really stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and people were like, Microsoft is eating Palantir's lunch. I'm like, okay, where, where is that software now? Like, where's the lunch that's been eaten? I mean, people really need to calm down, not ignore the competition or like even with within segments, if you look at, for example, PayPal and Apple Pay, yes, Apple Pay is growing. But if you look at the past three years, actually, PayPal has grown their market share compared to Apple Pay. So you really need to look at these things and analyze them and not just get upset and be like, well, this company is eating this company's lunch. I mean, it doesn't really work like that in the business world, uh, but yeah. it's not to be ignored completely either. But I don't really feel that Palantir is threatened anywhere. Today, no one truly does what they do. There are some companies that do parts of what Palantir does. There's no suite. There's no one striving to be a whole OS for an industry, right? I mean, uh, when we look at Foundry and FoundryCon, we see all these different use cases across these different industries, these different CEOs that have turned advocates for the software, they, they turn ambassadors. And then you look at, okay, but what about the development side that what we've seen from Coldstripe, for example? Right. I haven't seen anyone discuss that at length since Coldstripe. No one even talks about it. Like the whole uh, 
uh, development suite. No one talks about that. I mean, I mean, there's so many parts to this that I'm. Today, I I struggle to see any true competitor, and I'm not too worried. Yeah, and you know, when I had an yeah. elementary understanding of of them two years ago, it's so funny because like now I think my understanding is much more in depth. But it's the same thesis. I was like, I think the software can be used in every industry across the entire planet. And like in 2021, that was my thesis. I really didn't fully get it, but I was just like, I feel like they can be used everywhere. And, you know, when you say there's no competitors now, it's really because when you build a product that can be used everywhere, it's hard to imagine a competitor that can do what Pounter is doing for the Cleveland Clinic and also do it for uh, Cisco and also do it for Ukraine and also do it for the UK Ministry of Defense, also do it for the NHS, also do it for BP. It's just like and it's just not naming clients. It's naming actual results clients have gotten at such a trans at such a transformational level that you imagine that scaling um, and it could be really exciting. Go ahead. Yeah, but as an investor, you also have to ask yourself why. Why aren't we seeing more people do this? Because we know that the back work needed to reach that point simply isn't worth it for most yeah. uh, uh, businesses out there. I mean, why would Microsoft go out on an endeavor to replicate Palantir when we know that, according to CARP, it's at least five years out with the best engineers sink all these costs. And that's just to get where Palantir is today. So it takes five years to get where Palantir is today. Where is Palantir in those five years? I mean, they're not sitting on their hands. We're seeing constantly more and more product offerings. Uh, if you read the SEC filings, uh, I, I was going to tweet this uh, actually just yesterday, but I got caught up. But there, there, there's a line that says, we are looking to platformize uh different uh, offerings that that we have so they're making products out of things that they integrate to other customers and selling that i mean why would anyone try to compete with this like it doesn't seem really feasible from a business point of view for the players which actually could compete if they wanted to yeah uh, such as a microsoft i mean why why would they go on that endeavor but i do get that well you could compete in the segments like do part of what Palantir does sure I mean, we won't get right. away from that, but as a whole, no. So, okay, so kind Today. of my, la my, my last question for you is, uh, I guess, a two-parter. How do you feel about gap profitability S&P 500 catalysts coming up? And second, do you think revenue acceleration, or I guess the better way to frame frame it is, why hasn't revenue growth been uh, as good as we want to see, you know, last year, I know two years ago, it was 41%. And last year, I think it was 22. Now they're projecting 18. Do you think that's sandbagging? Do you think it's going to get back to that 30% Kager? How do you see that playing out? Uh, I'm going to start with the second one because, uh, it's early morning here. So I really, I already forgot the first one. So can you just note that and circle back? So in terms of the re revenue growth, I still in my models, have 4.5 billion by 2025 because this has been reiterated by CARP even after they redacted their 30% goal uh, Kager target that they've been having in each quarterly presentation up until uh, Q1 2022, right? Yeah. But uh, towards the end of the summer in 2022, he was on a CNBC interview and they asked him, well, why did you re uh, retract the 30% uh, Kager growth target? He says, uh, we can't have predictability in the quarterlies, but I'm still steering the company to 4.5 billion by 2025. Correct. So that's what, what, what I have modeled. And that is around a 31% Kager uh, if I extrapolate that to 2027. So that's what I use in my model, which might seem crazy, but I actually don't think it is. Prior to AIP, I could struggle to see, okay, how are they going to re-accelerate this? Because a really con concerning thing for me was that uh, the whole business model is centered around the customer count, right? Yeah. The, the customer count growth rate really has been de-accelerating since 2021. Uh, instead of growing their customer count by 22%, it went down to, I think like, I, I don't have the numbers in, in my head, but just as an example, like 18 and then the next quarter, 15, 5, I, I think they're down to about 6% uh, customer count growth yep. the past quarter. And and that really explains why we haven't seen the revenues grow at all. Yep. But with AIP, 
I can start to see how they will reach the 30% CAGR growth again. Uh, and I can see how they will re-accelerate the net dollar retention because... Like an upsell. Fun, funnily enough, uh, since they started including net dollar retention in their slides, it's only ticked down. Yeah, <laughs> it hasn't it hasn't gone up a single time since they started reporting on it. But as I start to see the story unfold, I can start to see how they will reach those targets. So I'm not too worried. Uh, I think they're sandbagging. To an answer your question, yes. But I think also my biggest bear thesis for the longest time was the uh, whole narrative around Palantir. Uh, because it affects the whole sales cycle and how the company is perceived. If you're seen as this, like, I mean, we have the Ross Gerbers of the world, the uh, Bucks Gloves of the world. Uh, I mean, and people don't really take, the, Wall Street doesn't take the time to understand this company even today. I mean, the revenue is uh, kind of uh, secondary. You can't just look at the revenue growth because the business model is not one that paints the picture by simply looking at the re revenues, right? What right. you have to look at is the customer count and the net dollar retention to really grasp uh, it as a whole. And that's why I was really concerned seeing the growth rate of the customer count really go down. Like, sure, the customer count increased, but if you really looked at it, it was a bit co concerning. And I was struggling to justify CARP's statement, like, well, we are guiding to 4.5 billion in 2025. I was like, I'm, I'm not seeing it. I have it in my model as a base case, but I'm not seeing it until they came out with AIP. And now suddenly I can actually see how they will reach that. Um, right. Especially when CARP is as arrogant enough as to say, yeah. uh, you know, our plan is to capture all the, the whole market. I don't think he's a guy that wants to stand up in front of investors in 2027, 2028 and say, A, we didn't capture the whole market or we didn't really try our hardest and we kind of just failed because our sales cycle sucked or whatever. Uh, or B, you know, I said we would get to 4.5 billion and we're at 3.3 billion because of, like he doesn't seem like a guy that makes excuses. Neither, neither does Peter Thiel. And for anything you guys want to say, you know, the, the world wants to say about Thiel and Carp, they get shit done.